Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question is, can I analyze the case of Todd Kendhammer? Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing anybody in this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoy this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and consider supporting me on Patreon. I'll put the link to Patreon in the description for this video. So first I'll look at the background in this case. It's fairly brief. I'll move to the timeline of the crime, and then I'll offer my analysis. This case takes place in La Crosse County, Wisconsin. It primarily involves two people, Todd Kendhammer and his wife, Barbara. Both of them were born in March of 1970. The couple would marry in 1991. This takes us to the timeline of the crime. We start at September 16, 2016. The police responded to a call by Kendhammer. The call was placed at 8.06 a.m. The police arrived at 8.09 a.m. So just three minutes later, Ken Hammer said he had left his home between 7.30 and 7.45 on his way to the town of Holman. He was traveling northbound on County Road M in his 2009 Toyota Camry with his wife in the passenger seat. As he was driving, a flatbed truck traveling southbound lost a metal pipe from its bed. So the truck was coming toward them and this pipe fell out. The pipe penetrated the front windshield of the passenger side of his vehicle, so the Camry, and struck his wife, Barbara. He turned onto another road, then accidentally put the car in reverse and ended up in a ditch. Ken Dammer had cuts on his hands and knuckles. He tried to explain the cuts by saying he attempted to block the pipe as it was coming through the windshield. An ambulance transported Barbara to the hospital. The police gave Ken Dammer a ride to the hospital as well so he could see his wife. On that drive, Kandhammer told the police that he was driving to a house to pick up a truck so he could replace the windshield in it. He said the truck that was carrying the pipe looked like it had a makeshift steel flatbed on it. It was dark blue or dark green. It may have been black. He did not see any markings on it, and he didn't see the driver. After the pipe struck his wife and he went into the ditch, he went to the outside of the vehicle and pulled the pipe out. So he didn't push it out from the inside. He walked around to the front of the car, grabbed the pipe, and pulled it out. He then pulled Barbara from the vehicle and attempted CPR for a few minutes before calling the police. Barbara died the next day at the hospital. After identifying a number of inconsistencies, which I will review in my analysis, the police decided to charge Ken Hammer with murder. On December 6, 2016, he was arrested and charged with first-degree intentional homicide. He was convicted and sentenced to life in prison with the possibility of parole after 30 years. He could be released as early as 2048. Now moving to my analysis. The chances of a pipe flying through a window and killing somebody are pretty low. But then again, murder is relatively rare as well, although it's more common than these magic flying pipes. It is possible that Todd Kenthammer was actually innocent. Interestingly, many of the friends and family members on both sides, on his side and Barbara's side, do believe the story about the killer pipe. Let's take a look at the evidence both for and against the idea that Todd Kendhammer is guilty. Looking at the evidence for, the case for his guilt is essentially based on the idea that Kendhammer's explanation for how Barbara died could not be true or is probably not true. It is inconsistent with the evidence. Let's take a look at some of these inconsistencies. The medical examiner said that Barbara died from blunt force trauma, but the pattern of injuries was inconsistent with being struck by a pipe. For example, among other damage, she had injuries on the back of her head. It appeared as though her neck had been compressed. There were bruises on her biceps. She had torn fingernails on two fingers, and she had scratches on her neck. Also, there was no glass on her body. One would expect there to be glass because this pipe was supposed to come through the windshield when she was sitting in the seat. And those glass fragments can be fairly small. They tend to stay on clothing. So this was a bit surprising. Ken Hamber also had injuries, including scratches on his neck and chest. He explained them by saying that he works with glass all the time and he gets scratched up. I guess he was working with glass without wearing a shirt. The damage to his hands was hard to explain. As I mentioned, he said he tried to block the pipe that seems incredibly difficult to believe. If an accident like that actually happened, 
that pipe would be moving at an incredibly fast speed. So he was driving along, out of nowhere this pipe comes through, and he has the reflexes to reach over and try to intercept the pipe as it comes through the passenger side of the windshield and strikes his wife. Those reflexes would be beyond even what an athlete would possess. Now, he also talked about trying to push the pipe back out from the inside. Again, ultimately, he pulled the pipe out from the outside. But he talked about trying to push it out like that could have damaged his knuckles. Maybe that's more believable than trying to block the pipe. But still, the damage on his knuckles looks a lot like he struck something with him, perhaps like his wife, like he was attacking another person as opposed to having contact with a pipe or the windshield. Normally, when people push things with their hands, they don't use their knuckles, right? So again, just very hard to believe. Ken Hammer's whole story about picking up the truck didn't check out either. He said that he was going to pick up a truck from a guy named Justin, but the truck actually belonged to one of Justin's friends named Ben. Justin told the police that he had a discussion with Ken Hammer about replacing the windshield in Ben's truck. So this part was true, but no arrangements were made to actually do the work. Ben used the truck on his farm, and he decided not to get the windshield repaired. Legally, he didn't need to get it repaired because it didn't go on public roads. The last time that Justin and Ken Hammer talked about the work was on August 23, 2016. And again, no commitment was made to complete the work. Ben, the owner of the truck, never talked to Ken Hammer. So Justin was the only one who ever talked to Ken Hammer, and that discussion had concluded a few weeks before. The next problem with Ken Hammer's story was that his time frame would have made Barbara late for work. She started work at 8 a.m. He did not call the police until 8.06 a.m., as I mentioned. Her co-worker said she was always on time. Barbara also failed to call her mother before 8 a.m. that morning when she normally would have. So she missed a call she usually would have made during a time when, according to Kent Hammer, she was still alive. Another motorist drove by Kent Hammer's Camry around 8.02 or 8.04 a.m. as the car was sitting in the ditch. He remembered this because he thought that was a strange place for a person to leave a car. That makes sense. You see this car in this ditch. Most people wouldn't park a car there, so that's going to stand out in somebody's memory. Now, he said that when he passed the vehicle, the passenger door was open and there was no damage to the windshield. In addition, nobody was around. So he didn't see Kent Hammer. He didn't see Barbara. No one was there. Video surveillance captured Kent Hammer's vehicle on the road, but no mysterious flatbed truck. So the police went around to private residences. One of those residences had a video surveillance system. You could see Kent Hammer's vehicle. The mysterious flatbed truck should have been captured by that same camera at some point, but it was not. This brings us to the reconstruction of the damage caused by the pipe. The section of pipe that ostensibly struck Barbara was 53 inches long, and it weighed over 10 pounds. In theory, it killed her, yet there was no blood on it. Experts concluded that the pipe traveled through the windshield when the passenger door was open. They didn't find the glass in the door storage compartment. And there was glass all over the passenger seat, as if no one was sitting in the seat when the glass hit it. This, of course, is also consistent with the finding that no glass was on Barbara's body. The location of the glass fragments on the gear shifter housing of the Camry was consistent with the vehicle being in park instead of being in drive at the time when the glass spread throughout the cabin. This is one of those things that Kent Hammer simply forgot when he was staging the scene. He didn't think to put the parking brake on and put the vehicle in drive. The pipe also hit the windshield at least one time prior to penetrating. So the pipe comes off of the truck, it hits the windshield, it backs up, and it hits the windshield again. It's very hard to imagine a pipe could ever do that according to the laws of physics. The police could not recreate the accident. They tried several times. So they had a truck, they pushed a pipe off of it. It just didn't behave in the way that Kent Hammer was describing. Outside of the inconsistencies with the story, the prosecution also believed that Kent Hammer was controlling, like in terms of his personality and his relationship with Barbara. 
He frequently communicated with Barbara using his phone, including voice and text. He wanted to know where she was. He wanted to know when she was going to meet him. He seemed a little bit intense. Let's look at the evidence against the idea that Kent Hammer was guilty. It would seem that everyone who knew Kent Hammer believed that he had a good relationship with Barbara. People didn't seem to think that he was controlling, rather just loving and caring. There wasn't really any motive for murder. There were no reasons he would have been better off in any dimension with Barbara dead. So all of a sudden, somebody who's happy in their marriage just kills their spouse? That doesn't seem to make a lot of sense. Usually, juries like to see a motive before convicting, but of course, they don't always need that. Ken Hammer did not have a history of violence or a criminal record. So again, we see kind of an out-of-the-blue theory of the crime. Usually, in cases where a man ultimately kills his wife, we see a pattern of escalating violence and other clues, like the wife is telling friends that she is afraid of her husband, the relationship is not in good shape, she's worried. Nothing like that occurred in this situation. The wife might make an effort to hide bruises and cuts caused by the husband. Perhaps there's a trip to the emergency room that's difficult to explain outside of domestic violence. No reports of anything like that here. The wife's mood might be depressed. There might be feelings of hopelessness. Barbara was described as being cheerful and positive. If Kent Hammer had beaten Barbara to death, where did the crime occur? In theory, it would have been at his residence, but that didn't appear to be a crime scene. It's hard to resolve this idea that he was intelligent enough to perfectly clean up the actual crime scene, yet not intelligent enough to know that everybody would see through the deception involving the pipe story. So in weighing all the evidence in this case, what do I think happened here? Was he actually guilty? I believe he was guilty by the legal standard, that is, guilty beyond a reasonable doubt, and I think he was actually guilty, like in real life. I think the only way to believe in his innocence would be to believe that he staged this accident to cover up for someone else who killed Barbara. That's how convinced I am that he, in fact, staged that accident. This doesn't make a lot of sense, though. Why would somebody stage an accident to protect another killer? Did he damage his hands trying to protect her from this assailant? If this was the case, why not just say what really happened? Why not just tell the police, hey, look, there was this killer, and I tried to protect Barbara, but I wasn't able to. I guess the other theory could be suicide, but it's really unclear how Barbara could have self-inflicted those injuries. And again, why would he be covering up those actions? Why would that be so important to do? He'd rather keep that secret and spend life in prison? That doesn't make a lot of sense either. So with all this, again, I do think he was guilty. The damage to his body and her body was consistent with him beating her to death and attempting to strangle her. Maybe she attacked him first. It's hard to know. Claiming that would have been a much better defensive strategy for him than creating the whole fantasy about the pipe. He could have said that she hit him, maybe even with some type of object or a weapon, and he defended himself and he went too far. He probably would have still been convicted of something, but it may have been less serious than the crime he was convicted of. Moving on to the next question. Could his controlling behavior be consistent with homicide or a homicide that does not have warning signs? Again, we see this crime was committed out of the blue. At least that's the theory. Could somebody who's demanding and controlling behave in that way? The answer to this question is maybe. Let's take a closer look. Kent Hammer may have been demanding and controlling as far as his relationship with Barbara, but able to recognize how his behavior would be frowned upon by others. Therefore, he was careful to control his image, to make sure that no signs of abuse were detected. It may have also been that his controlling nature created this environment where he would not be violent, but once he passed beyond a certain point, he could be extremely violent. Like he could control himself up until he couldn't. His violent behavior didn't really run on a continuum, it was all or nothing, like a catastrophic failure of a balloon as opposed to a balloon leaking air slowly. In a manner of speaking, some people appear good until they are bad, and when they appear bad, they're really bad. What is my theory of the crime in light of this idea that Kent Hammer was controlling? The couple has some type of argument, 
one that pushed Kent Hammer over the edge. This was atypical. Again, normally he can control his physical aggression. He impulsively beat her and attempted to strangle her. He sustained damage in the attack. He was unwilling to accept any responsibility. Again, he could have said that she attacked him first. He could have made a much more believable story. Maybe he got the whole situation down to something like manslaughter. But his all-or-nothing nature made it so that he wanted to be completely free of punishment. This is consistent with his expression of controlling behavior. The same demanding attitude that led to the murder also led to the cover-up. So with all this in mind, we see that Kent Hammer panics because he doesn't know how to completely escape the consequences. He considers his options. He then comes up with this far-fetched idea about the pipe. He loads Barbara into the car and takes the pipe with him. Maybe at this point, he was still leaving his options open, like thinking about simply dumping her body and claiming that she disappeared. He places the car partially off the road in a place where he doesn't think there will be a whole lot of traffic and begins to stage the accident scene. In his haste, it never occurs to him to put Barbara in the seat before punching the pipe through the window, and it doesn't occur to him, as I mentioned, to put the car in drive with the parking brake applied. He follows through with his ridiculous plan and never changes the story. I doubt he ever will change his story. Moving to the last question, why were so many family members behind him? Why do so many people believe that he's actually innocent? Probably because losing Barbara was difficult and losing both of them would be unbearable. It can also be that they simply cannot reconcile how somebody could appear nice and helpful yet commit this heinous crime. Maybe believing that would introduce an uncertainty and a lack of safety into their lives, which could not be tolerated. So those are my thoughts on the case of Todd Kenthammer. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comment section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be interesting. Thanks for watching.